Thank you for taking some time here and joining us uh, in Vancouver. Of course. So, um, well, I guess we'll just get right to it. When, when did you know you were going to get into curling and especially at the level that you're at? Like, were you a little kid? Uh, yeah, well, I started when I was five. My dad curled uh, when he was in high school and from yeah. that point uh, on. I, I saw was, that I saw that video where your dad was like kind of welling up, kind of crying almost, talking about, you know, when you're like a five-year-old. But that's when you started playing, eh? Yeah, so I wouldn't call it playing. Um, I was introduced to the game. Um, the They have little rocks, so they're a lot lighter than the rocks that we play with now. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to play. <laughs> uh, but I don't even think I slid out of the hack when I first started. I just pushed the rock from the hack and launched it to the other end. Um, probably didn't make it past the far hog line most of the time, but I loved it. There was a <laughs> little hot chocolate break and a snack and... Uh, yeah, I just, I played for a few years just in the club and it was when I probably was turning eight or nine, I started to actually go into little rock competitions where we could go and play against other kids of a similar age at other curling clubs in the city. And that's when I really started to fall in love with it, being able to actually compete with a team and, um, meet all these other people and um, the competitive side of me really came out so that's really when I started to put a lot more time into it right and so it, it, for you to think back what's the first curling memory for you um I like my first curling memory from that age I was playing in events with my brother <laughs> but uh yeah. and a couple other um young players there uh was that we actually won a little rock event. And I was like, Oh, wow. I didn't like, I didn't know how we would compare to other players in the city. Um, we had just been playing at the local club level. So I realized like, Oh, maybe I'm like kind of good at this. And then it was, um, in that same time frame where we started to play, you could, there were a higher caliber events and then there were play downs that would go to like the Ottawa region competition. <laughs> and that's when I met up with, or we were playing against um, Allison Krevizak, who ended up being my longtime teammate and Rachel Homan, who obviously is my longtime teammate. Right. Um, so we ran, we were playing against each other at these little rock events and that ended up, I remember seeing them being like, wow, they're really good. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up teaming up and becoming a team after that. So that's kind of my first real memory is um, all my seeing them and then teaming up with them and all my years with them working hard at a young age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Uh, and of course, you just finished playing at the Scotties in, in Kamloops. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, of course, COVID and everything. And how much did COVID screw with your world? Well, we were really lucky that we were able to still compete um, for the for part of our season. Not at all the events ran. Obviously, everything was shut down. Um, then Curling Canada was able to actually bubble us and allow us to play our national championship, um, the mixed national championship, and the two Grand Slams they added to the end of that. So there was a bubble from about uh, early February until start of May where I was going in and out. Um, so I felt very grateful that we were actually able to compete. It was definitely not an easy environment to compete in. Uh, not only the stress of not getting COVID and going into the event and bringing it in and giving it to everyone and having the event shut down. So that was stressful being at home was, but that's my dog. Um, but it was also very lonely and isolated in the event until we had a certain amount of negative tests. You had to be completely by yourself in a room. So that was really hard um, as a social person. Um, being by myself in a room was difficult. <laughs> um, and you don't want to, if you break any rules, you're kicked out. So it was like hard. You're staying in the room and um we were thankful we could compete and that it was great but um it was hard it was a hard time um and no fans also is lonely yeah. on the air. <laughs> and, and, and that's got to be weird too not only no fans but 
obviously no, you know, no parents and no friends, like they can't support you like normal, right? Exactly. It yeah. was just a very weird couple of years. And it wasn't even just that first year. We were bubbled for the second year too. So uh, we thought we were past it and then we ended up in a bubble again. So um, mm-hmm. this year was normal and it was awesome. <laughs> it was great. All of our, um, our families went out and yeah, it was yeah. pretty fun. That's cool. And so, so what were some of the highlights from this past Scotties for you? Well, one, to just have a regular Scotties again, we were able to go out for dinners. We were able to see our parents and um, we could hang out together beforehand. And there was no isolation. All of that was pretty awesome. And just being able to compete again in a regular environment. And and Carrie Ironerson uh, with like four, four wins in a row, like four years yeah. ago. It, at this point, has she just become annoying? Is it just annoying? <laughs> well, no, it's impressive. And I think that it's everything like that is just good for the sport and helping grow the sport and pushing it in the right direction. And um, curling is one of those games that a lot of people are taking notice of. Um, so a news headline like that and watching such a great team perform um, helps helps with growing curling. Yeah. Yeah, and you'd mentioned, uh, you know, uh, your skip home and you've been with her for over a couple of decades now. Like, clearly you're at the point of like, it's best friends, it's it's sister kind of kind of vibes, I bet, right? Yeah, yeah. We're basically, like, we're basically family. Yeah. Um, we uh, have gone through all the highs and lows together. So it's uh, it's pretty special. What are some of the key moments thinking back uh, with her? I mean, that's a lot of years to go over, but like, what are some of your favorite memories maybe of curling with her? Well, we've had some hard losses, but we've always been able to bounce back and be better from all those hard losses. And I think those are the ones that stand out the most uh, is be going through those hard times and um, on the ice where we lose a, a game we shouldn't lose or we don't perform at the level we want to perform at and then being able to bounce back and then actually win that event that we we failed at the first time. And I think that's just sport in general is you're going to fail and you're going to succeed. No one succeeds all the time continuously or there wouldn't be a sport. So um, mm-hmm. it's just a matter of how we learn from those losses, those hard losses. And we always chose to learn from them and battle through them together instead of deciding that the other person was the problem and moving on in a different direction. I think that what ma- that's what makes us so unique. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was watching the videos and I don't know, like, I don't know if you're just saying it to say it, but you guys actually hang out. Like, it's not just uh, you go to the rink and you, you do your thing, but you're, you're actual friends outside of the sport. Oh yeah. And curling is such a small team sport too. Uh, so most teams, there's only four people. You spend a lot of time together. Uh, so if you don't like, the people you're playing with, it's a long season. We're playing from mid August until May. Um, So that's, I think why there's a lot of movement on teams because it's a lot of time that you spend with your teammates. And if you're not enjoying that time, um, it's hard to feel like it's worth it to be away that much um, and not being enjoying that time. Um, Whereas I haven't really had that experience. And like, we've really enjoyed all that time. And I like being on the road with my team and we have so much fun. So it's, uh, I'm very lucky. Yeah. A a lot, a lot of people, of course, with the skip, they always, you know, that's the pressure spot, but there's truly like every spot is a pressure spot. Like you can't have a shitty rock. No, not anymore. (laughs) Yeah, You're at that level of like, there's no more of that. No. Yeah. The, the caliber of teams across the world are so strong. Uh, If you make any mistake at any point, that could be the game. So every position is so important and uh, putting rocks in the right spot, managing them properly, whether that's sweeping or line calling are all very important elements of curling. So it's not even just shot making Um, from an individual standpoint, you want to be close on when you throw the rock, but everyone else's management, once you let it go contributes just as much to the shot as your throwing does. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody controls your hurry hard. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> no yeah. we see that ourselves <laughs> <laughs> do you have any uh i'm sure you get this all the time but do you have any uh pre-game rituals any superstitions maybe 
So they kind of depend on event to event because if something stops working, we just throw it out the window. But sure. um, unfortunately, during some of the Grand Slam events, which are a little bit shorter, I get um, like the same jersey is to go on and I'm a sweeper. So that's we have four jerseys. The jersey I put on has no impact on the game. I know that, but I get weird about it. And I just wear the same one throughout the whole event as long as we keep winning. If we lose a game, I'm like, okay, that one's done. Now I'll grab a new one. This one's fresh. Um, and sometimes socks, which is just something I need to stop doing. So <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get past that. And then we usually take the same route, sit in the same car or seem seats in the car that just nothing crazy, but yeah. Yeah. But, but it sure feels good doing it though. It does. You feel in control, even though there's yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, now, didn't they, now, I'm not sure. I, I, I wanted to check this out, but, um, uh, but you'll definitely be able to clarify it. They implemented the new rules at the World Championships with the no tick zone, mm -hmm. uh, the four minute uh, end, and and the no extra ends. Are those still in effect? And and what's the trickiest thing about that? They only kept one of those, so I've played with all of them at some point. Um, the tick rule has been implemented and is staying, as far as I know. So uh, so what that, is that rule then? Um, if a rock is in the free guard zone and it's touching the center line, you cannot move it off the center line. Oh. So it, the rock could only move if it's just touching the center line. It could move over like almost rock length and then it would still have to be touching the center line on the other side. So what the biggest impact from that one is that if you wanted to open up the scoring area to make sure open up the button um, to make sure that you scored one. So this happened a lot when teams were tied with hammer going into the last end to mm -hmm. make sure you scored one, you would play the tick shot. So you would remove, not remove the rock from play, but move it as far off to the side as you could so that you had the most scoring area on your lap, like going for the whole end. Right. Right. Um, and so that shot became very, uh, a high percentage of makes. So a lot of teams got very good at it. So they wanted to make it more interesting going into the last end and say that you can't remove that rock anymore. And the steals have gone way up since then. Stealing used to be almost impossible mm. unless you had a full miss from the other team. And now the steals have gone up quite a bit. Mm. So it, it, it's better then. Well, it depends. It's better if you're trying to steal. <laughs> if, if <laughs> it's more tied, exciting. Yeah, if you've managed the game to be tied with Hammer in the last end, um, it. I liked being able to play the tick, obviously, because you. it's a nice way of just opening everything up and having an easier shot at the end to win the game. Mm -hmm. um, so it's changed the approach of a lot of teams, and the first two rocks of the game have to be placed so perfectly to put the most pressure on the other team to not give up that steal, but um, everyone will get used to it eventually. <laughs> mm. So it's a little bit of strategy. Strategy is, is, is playing into that. That sounds like. Yeah. And execution. Mm. It just makes everyone's shots a little bit harder. Yeah. Um, Emma, maybe talk about the winter Olympics. Of course you've, you've been there. What still stands out from your time uh, at the Olympics? It, I'm lucky enough to have gone before the lockdown year this right. past so I got to go in 2018 um in Pyeongchang um it was a very cool experience uh just being there with all the other athletes um and being able to be one big team Canada was very a very unique experience very cool mm -hmm. um it was very difficult as well because we were not performing and we had won the year before the worlds in 2017 we were world champions. So we had a bit of a target on our back, but we also had a high expectations going into the Olympics and we just didn't quite perform at the level that we had the year before. Um, and everyone else was playing so well. And they kind of watched what we did the year before and played really tough against us. So um, results wise, it was hard to, it was a hard pill to swallow that we weren't going to medal at the Olympics, which was our goal like we wanted to go in there and we wanted to come home with a gold medal for Canada and to not even make the playoffs was very disappointing mm. and it was a difficult 
a difficult time because it can taint your Olympic experience. It can put this dark shadow over the Olympics. Every time people would talk about it, I wouldn't want to talk about it because it was this tainted experience. We didn't medal. We underachieved. I don't want to talk about it. So it took a bit of time before I was actually able to be proud of myself and as a team proud of what we did. We we won the Olympic trials in Canada. That's a really hard thing to do. And we represented Canada at the Olympics. That's also a really hard thing to do. And mm-hmm. the fact that we didn't get our ultimate results, we can't control that, but we can still appreciate that whole time and look back with fond memories instead of having it all tainted. So it did take a little bit of time to get there, but I am very proud that that we were there. I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of the team. I'm, I'm proud that we were able to wear the maple leaf um, on the Olympic stage. Yeah. And, and like you say, you know, coming in and you're the world champs, there, there's an expectation that it's going to happen, but you can't always play at that high caliber level. It's just, you can't have those expectations. No. And like we talked about one important shot miss can impact your whole week there. So yeah. Um, yeah and there's so much, there's so many good teams that, uh, you can't be just a little off anymore. You have to be really sharp. Yeah. And, and what's an a, an average training schedule for you when you're like in the thick of it? Like, I'm, I'm sure there's people that are thinking like curling, how hard can that be? But it like, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's intense, isn't it? Yeah. So when we're at home um, practices, I practice six of seven days a week. Um, And if I'm by myself, I'm out there for about an hour. If we have a team practice, it's usually about three. Mm -hmm. Um, And then on top of that, I'm doing some sort of physical activity, whether it's working with my trainer, um, interval training or cardio on the off days, Um, not on the off, like every day. (laughs) And there's one off day where I'll actually just fully recover and maybe do a yoga Uh, So it's uh, multiple hours a day that go into the training. Um, And it's more just, I don't think everybody puts the same amount of time into their training. I think it depends person to person on what individually you need in order to perform. Uh, For me, I never want to feel like I didn't do enough. So it's hard for me to turn it off. So I'm, I'm always out there until it feels perfect but then there's other people who if they go too far it actually is more detrimental to their performance so they have to cut it off at a certain point Mm. um so yeah it's really just up to the individual yeah yeah um it's a tough question and it's kind of a cliche question but i want to know can you pick one career highlight or is that just too hard for career highlight in terms of an event or a result, um, picking one would probably be winning the Olympic trials because it not only was, um, it's a hard week. It's, it's all these amazing teams. You want to go to the Olympics. Um, the Olympics is this once every four years thing. You don't get to do this all the time Mm -hmm. that winning that, um, on top of the fact it was in Ottawa where I was born and raised, was just the most amazing feeling. Um, It still gives me goosebumps thinking about it. There were all our friends and family were there watching in person. Um, It was just something I can't even describe how cool that was. You cried. Oh yeah. (laughs) And then a close second (laughs) would be the Worlds the year before. Winning the gold finally at Worlds uh, would be a close second. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Deadly. Uh, not not to get too deep on you, but where do you see yourself in like five years? I mean, it's hard to say. I always kind of said, depending on how curling goes, I would never want to keep playing if I am not able to put the full time into being the best that I can be. And um, so if I'm not improving anymore, or I'm decreasing and we're not able to win anymore. I wouldn't want to keep going out there and doing it. So, because that makes it less enjoyable, but um, it's, it, that's a hard thing to say. It all depends on um, my teammates and what they're up to and where I, where I would land uh, depending on, cause that you never know with how our bodies are holding up. It's an asymmetrical sport. It can be easy for some and difficult for others. So I hope to still be playing and I hope to still be 
um, at the top of my game, but uh, I would hate to just put in, go through the motions and not really be enjoying it. I want to always be enjoying it. Well, there's always going to be that kid that's on your tail trying to get your spot, right? So if you're not fully into it, then step aside. Yeah. And let them take over, right? Yeah. Yeah. Emma, thank you for, for doing this again. Uh, I want to get outside of curling for a little bit, if that's cool. Sure. So I, I'm curious about the music that in the Miscue house as a as a kid growing up. Like, what are your what are your parents playing? What are you, what are you listening to as you're a kid growing up? Um, my dad was the a big Beatles fan, so there was a lot of the Beatles. Um, Simon and Garfunkel, uh, just kind of like that genre, the like kind of yeah. classic rock. <laughs> um, yeah. A lot to like, yeah. So that was kind of what they would listen to. And um, when we took road trips, it would be the classic rock radio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And what was the first concert that you went to? Ooh, the first concert. Um, Now I'm, I don't remember. Um, going I've been the, to going through the cobwebs. <laughs> yeah. More recently, I've been to. <laughs> like I've seen the Backstreet Boys like four or five times. So yeah, wow. I mean, they keep coming back. So I keep going. <laughs> like, keep going back. I'm going to keep going. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah. I think that might've been the first one. Um, yeah. I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. And, and which uh, TV shows are you binge watching right now when right, you find the time? Right now. Um, I just started the Royals which was recommended yep. by a friend. Um, and then you came out with a new season. So it's hard to binge watch. There's only five episodes, but the next five are coming short, shortly. So I'll be watching that. What's you about again? Uh, somebody well, told me to watch that and it's, <laughs> they were like, keep an open mind. The first few couple seasons, this guy is kind of a likable stalker. It's very strange why you, and that's, I think what draws people in is that, you like him even though you shouldn't like him right? Uh, because he's not a good person, but then you think he may be a good person, but he's, yeah, he's a bit of a, he's a stalker and, but thinks he's helping these women. Anyway, it's well done. It's the Dan Humphrey from gossip girl is the main character. So mm. he, yeah, well, he's well known in anyone who watched gossip girl. And I, had watched that and I saw the advertisement. I'm like, all right, I'm in. And then I was pretty hooked. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Neither. <laughs> Neither. Really? <laughs> I didn't watch either. of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, you're clearly one of the best curlers Canada's ever had. What are your other sports? If you're not playing curling, like, are you good at any other sports? Um, I'm, I wouldn't say it. Not Wait, Olympic level, but um, yeah. I played soccer when I was younger for a while. Um, I don't think I ever would have been national level. I was pretty good at it. Uh, I had to choose between curling and soccer because they both started going more year round. Yep. Uh, and I enjoyed curling more from a teammate perspective. So I stuck with that. Uh, and I've played tennis kind of recreationally mm. um I wouldn't say I'm very good at it. I've done some lessons here and there and then I have golfed pretty much my whole life as well oh um, okay so but, how's the golf game well it's hit or miss I can drive the ball pretty far and straight my mm. short game is pretty bad so I I've I went for a lesson last year it was like my drive is off. I don't know why. So we worked on that. But next time I go, I'm going to work on my short game because that's really where the problem is. No, oh, totally. I mean, if you can if you can own pitch and putts, you yeah. should be able to transfer that over to full size courses. Well, exactly, exactly. Right. So yeah. I I'm if I play on a best ball team, I'm usually it's quite good because I will use my drive a lot because we I can tee off from the women's tees, so there's a bit of advantage, and then I drive the ball pretty far. Yeah. But we don't use my ball very much after that, so. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. All right, Emma, I'm, I'll ask you a couple more questions and we'll wrap it up here. Um, are you a gambler? Um, Ever play, place sports bets? 
Yes. So only we got uh, cool that as a sponsor and I hadn't really done online sports betting before I had done some, and it wasn't sports betting. I had in terms of gambling done actual in-person in the casino gambling, but not really with the app or anything. So we got cool about as a sponsor. I'm like, okay, well, I have to understand how it works. People are going to ask me. And then I got hooked. Uh, (laughs) I'm just, we can't bet on anything of our own or anything that we know anything about, but it's really fun and addicting (laughs) to go in there and (laughs) try to, and like watching game results and hoping they go your way. I really like a good parlay. I know that's not the right way of doing it, but the payout is just so much better. Yeah. Just making it that much more exciting too. Yeah. A little bit more, right? All right. Now, last one. Uh, And it's not really a a question, more of a story. If you have one, do you have a near death story where you're like, holy crap, I could have just died? Interesting question. I think I had one almost car accident in bad weather um, on an on ramp to a highway. And I had a car full of, I, I only had my license for probably a year or two at the time. And it was just icy conditions. I was driving, I think six people back from um, a suburb in Ottawa. And uh, I was, didn't do anything wrong. I was just on the on-ramp and I hit ice and the car just started spinning, but it was one of those on-ramps that had a pretty steep (laughs) hill on either side of it. And I managed to stay on the road, but like I, my heart was just pounding and I like ripping the wheels super tight the rest of the way home. (laughs) Um, That wasn't very fun. I felt that might've been where, and it wasn't even just me. I'm like, all these people's lives just flashed through my eyes. So that yeah. wasn't a great one. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I guess I have one one last thing. I guess I got three three for you. So tell us a bit about your business, uh, Shimmer and Oak. Yeah, um, I started that a couple of summers ago during COVID. I was trying to come up with a baby gift for uh, one of my best friends. They... Um, we're having a second boy. So they didn't really need anything. They had everything. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to come up with something unique that I could gift for them that uh, wouldn't just be something that would be worn once and thrown out or given away. Um, and so I had I put on their names on some wood and painted it on and just tried to make something look really pretty that they could hang on the wall. Uh, just some artwork. Um, yeah. Something unique and, yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. Um, and as I, after I've made it, I was like, wow, that's really nice. I feel like people would might want to buy this and maybe I could sell it. So just at all this time, um, curling was basically not starting. I, I had way more time than I normally would have with everything being shut down and no social life. Uh, cause we're all locked into our homes. So it's like, oh, I'll just start a little company. So um, I make custom wood art and I actually, it's with the same technique, but totally different, um, custom etched glasses and on the glass where, um, it doesn't actually wash off, which is what makes it so unique compared to everything else in the market is normally something customizable. That's just one, um, it's with vinyl. And then if you put a little too warm of water in the sink or it goes in the dishwasher, it's just peeling right off. So this is actually permanent. Um, so a lot of people really like it. Mm. What's the website? Uh, shimmeranoak.com. There you go. Yeah. Right, we'll go check it out. Uh, thank you again for jumping on the podcast here in Vancouver. Um, you're easy to find online. Emma Miskew on both uh, Twitter and, and Instagram. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to plug? Uh, no, I don't think so. But thanks for yeah. mentioning Shimmer and Oak. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you again, and uh, Emma, we'll, uh, I guess we'll see you online.